Alan Topper, Marsha Abel, Mindy Ward, and David Hare. And you're going to hear a little bit from Mindy and David in a minute because this is a expert seminar, so we have lots of different experts. So today we're going to give you 10 real estate tips and hopefully provide you some information that will be helpful whether you're buying or selling a house. And um, so we'll get started right away. And David Hare is our first expert, and we're going to talk about first first time home buyers. And we should have first time home buyers on Facebook. That's where they are, because none of these folks are first-time homebuyers. Um, well, Kelsey's a first-time homebuyer, and why now is the time to buy. So David's going to give you some reasons that you should buy uh, now, and interest rates went down today, and we have a banker from Old National here as well, so we'll talk about that a little bit. So, David. Well, like Carol said, my name is David Hare. I've uh, been on the team for about three, two and a half years. Um, Talk a little bit about being a first time home buyer and uh, why it's a great time to buy a house. It's a good time to buy in general for everyone who's not a first time home buyer for all these reasons as well. But uh, um, interest rates are historically low, as Carol said, they actually have gone down in the last week and a half. Um, so that's an excellent time to lock in a good rate. You can lock in a rate once you um, have a purchase agreement in place. Um, urban settings offer good value. Evansville is consistently ranked as one of the lower cost of living places in the nation. Um, I always tell people who are renting now, you know, it's so much cheaper to buy a house, even if you have maintenance costs, just the equity you're going to build, the interest is tax deductible, it's cheaper generally for the same uh, sized place, you know, an 800 square foot apartment is usually a lot higher uh, monthly than an 800 square foot house. And then uh, rents are, are just on the rise and the interest rates just keeping uh, them low, um, keep it affordable. So, that's all I've got. Thanks, David. Um, one of the things I want to just add on to what David said about cost of living in Evansville, for anyone that's watching this that doesn't live in Evansville, Evansville is the second most affordable place to live in the United States. So Fort Wayne is the first, Evansville is the second, a lot of people don't know that. A lot of it is because of uh, our good state government, uh, low uh, uh, taxes that are held at 1%, and there are other factors that go into that. So. Yeah, we, we use that a lot in our, our marketing materials for uh, people that are moving into the area. Okay, the second thing we're going to talk about is um, it is a seller's market, but houses still have to be ready to sell. And we're going to have some other experts talk more specifically about some of these things. But um, this is something we cannot uh, emphasize enough. We have a lot of people that want to put their house on the market and they get it on the market and then they're disappointed because they don't get it sold within, you know, their neighbor sold their house in two days or a week and their house is sitting sort of languishing. So um, what we want to talk about is um, how we can help get that house sold quickly because it is a pain. You know, you've got your house listed, you got to keep it clean. Um, so our first tip is, um, under this tip, is that light makeovers throughout the home are the best investment. One of the things we talk about is um, if you go into bathrooms and kitchens and if you have you know, everything in brass, uh, moving that to the brushed nickel or uh, uh, rubbed bronze, doing something that looks more up to date. Another really uh, less expensive makeover than redoing a whole bathroom or kitchen is light fixtures are very affordable and you, there are a lot of the big box stores that you can go to um, and get very reasonable light fixtures. And be sure to look at the outside of the home too. A lot of times we don't go in the front door. We talk about front doors a lot and you think, why do you talk about these so much? It's because that is the first place that people go. So um, maybe the lights out by the door are, are really bad. So um, that's something that we want to pay attention to. Focus on your kitchen first. That's the most important room in the house. And then bathrooms. We always say kitchens and bathrooms sell houses. So um, if you don't want to go to the expense to put, granite is still really popular. Quartz is becoming more popular. Uh, but make sure that, you know, maybe something you can do if you don't have a backsplash. Uh, you could, that is much less expensive than doing, you know, granite top. So look at those things. And Mindy's going to talk later tonight about rate of return. What's your rate of return or ROI, rate of investment, return on investment? Um, and we'll talk, she's, we've got specific numbers about what uh, the highest things are, the best things for rate of return. 
And this is the other thing that um, amazes me about houses as well. You cannot clean your house too much if you're putting your house on the market. You cannot do it. Uh, we go into a lot of houses as real estate agents. And first of all, if you have an animal, your house probably smells like that animal, which is perfectly okay if you live there. But if, you, if someone is coming in, that is immediately going to turn them off. So, um, you know, get some Febreze, clean your carpets, and usually it's in the furniture. So, uh, you may have to clean the furniture. And we're not trying to hide anything. We just want it, we want people, because your animals aren't going to stay there with you. I mean, with the people that are buying your house. So, we, we want to give you a good um, start. Um, the other thing is ceiling fans. I was in a house last night and I looked up and there was just stuff hanging from the ceiling fans. It's kind of like, yeah, mine probably looked like that. I don't do because I haven't looked up at those lately. <laughs> so uh, just really look, look around, um, you know, listen to whoever your real estate agent is because they're, they're trying to help you, you know, sell your house. And then declutter and depersonalize. Um, this is very important to take down family photos. Uh, people spend a lot of time looking at family photos that, you know, they're just trying to figure out who the people are. Um, that has nothing to do with the house. We want them focused on the architectural features of the home and how their family would live in the home. And we want them to feel comfortable that they're not kicking some poor family out. Um, so that's one of the reasons that we ask you that you do that. So those are some of the tips on um, how to get your house sold, even if it's a seller's market, quickly. Um, so now we're going to talk about home inspections. This is one of our favorite topics, and that's why we every we this is our fourth one of these. So um, we we always invite the home inspectors because people get a lot of good information. So we've got two experts tonight, and um, the only thing I'm going to say is I cannot emphasize enough the importance of having a home inspection before you put your house on the market. Uh, especially now we are finding, and Rob knows this. Um, if there are problems with the house that people perceive as insurmountable, mold is a big one. We find water in crawl spaces. You can, here's the happy news, you can treat for mold, you can mitigate it, you can get rid of it. But it is something that frightens people because they don't understand it. So by having a home inspection and being pro, proactive, then you can find out what that and other problems might be so that you can correct them before you put your house or condo or whatever you're selling on the market. So, um, and we're going to start by introducing uh, Rob Cahill with National Inspection Service, and he's going to give you some other tips about home inspections. And then Mike, we'll just go to you from okay. me. Hello, I'm Rob Cahill. I'm with National Inspection Service of Indiana. Um, our company's been doing inspections here in southern Indiana. Oh, sorry. <laughs> in southern Indiana for about 23 years. So uh, I've got three other inspectors that work with me. And um, what I want to do is just give you out, whoever's here that's either buyer or seller, I'm going to give you a uh, brochure that gives our price list. And it's also just a nice little thing about preparing your house for a home inspection. And it just probably goes over everything Carol's been emphasizing is Cleaning up your house, clean your gutters, have your furnace cleaned and serviced, or this time of year have the AC cleaned and serviced. Have things that you should be doing. Uh, hopefully, if you own your house, you are doing all these things. But so many times we find that people don't. And that lack of maintenance typically is what causes so many problems. Gutters, I consider cleaning gutters maintenance. But 90% of the time, if you've got water issues in your crawl space or your basement, it's because of buried down spouts that go under grade where you don't know where they discharge to. Gutters being stopped up with leaves. I mean, obviously right now, if you haven't been up and cleaned your gutters, you might want to. Uh, we're, getting into, we're getting into May and that's our rainy season and that's when you got, now's when we start seeing water and mold and all those issues in crawl spaces. Um, so it's very important that you do uh, have those things taken care of and you just follow the list. I mean, go through it each, uh, each point and it doesn't take that long, but I would say spend a weekend um, 
doing this as, as well as doing the interior, but go through and, and make sure you get the house in the best shape you can. And uh, it's amazing to me at, at how many houses we go into and we find that they just haven't taken care of things and they know we're coming, you know. <laughs> if you know I'm coming to do an inspection and you don't take the door off your crawl space and look in there, you know, you're making a big mistake because if I call out, you got a foot of water and I can't go in, some people are gonna freak out and it's maybe just a sump pump that's bad. But, and then once you have water, what's everybody think? What's the first thing you think of if you got water problems? Hello, Hello there you go. So. Boom, they go hand in hand, and it's not, it's not uncommon, it's not unfixable, it's, it's, it, is, it can be a health issue for certain people, most healthy people, it, it, mold's not gonna bother you. Um, but if you've got issue, you know, health issues and or asthma or anything like that, then mold can be a big problem for you. So, um, and that is something big. As far as, as a buyer, when you're buying a home there again, kind of take this list and uh, there's a lot of things you can go through when you're looking at that house. Look at the, don't just look at where your furniture's gonna go and where, look and you know, read through the sales disclosure, see how old the roof is. Look at the heating and air, do they look like they're 20 or 30 years old, you know? You can tell just, uh, you know, those are things you're probably not normally looking for as you're looking at your houses, but those should be things you're considering because those are gonna be added costs to you when you move into that house. And as a home inspector, we're gonna inspect it that day and see if it works. We're gonna see if it's in pro installed properly, if it's safe. But if it's old and working, we can't get you a new furnace just, just because it's old, you know? So that's something else though. Uh, but sometimes you can negotiate some of those things up front if you know for sure you've got some older issues. Uh, our older components in the home, old appliances, any of that kind of stuff. That's really all I got from that standpoint, unless anybody's going to, are you going to have anybody questions have at the end, or how are you doing well, that? Well, do does anybody have any questions for, for or about home inspections? And, and we're going to give prizes away at the end. Gonna... No. no questions about home inspections. <laughs> okay. Well, how long do they last? How long, as far as an average home inspection? The size of the home has a lot to do with it. I did one this morning. I think I was there for four hours. Uh, but oh, I, I meant if I got one this year, would it, would it be good next year? That's what I was thinking. Well, if, if you're... Because you're thinking about selling next year. Or, yeah, or sometime. sometime in the yeah. future, right? I mean, really, the inspection theoretically is good for the day we're there. I mean, it's not a guarantee or warranty that things are going to keep working. But what you can do even a year in advance is know expense-wise what, what things are going to come up in this home inspection report and what things I either want to fix or I want to disclose and say, hey, my roof's 15 years old. I know it's almost shot, but I'm not going to replace it. So you can kind of uh, use that as a tool as a seller to uh, let people know exactly what, what, what you've got. Yeah, it's really a good tool. So you can, then you know what you want to have fixed now as well. And there's always surprises that we don't know. We're living in a house. Sometimes the inspector can find a small gas leak. They can find a pipe. Let's say in that crawl space, there's um, a little bit of water or something going on. Maybe there's a leak from a pipe that can be simply fixed. So those are things that you want to get corrected and, and then again, as Rob says, if, and if they, you know your roof's 15 years old, well, next year it's going to be 16, and that's something you can disclose on the seller's disclosure, and, and buyers will know about that. So, okay. so that's helpful. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. All right, Mike. Let's have you come up and talk about termites. And while Mike's coming up, just want to emphasize, you know, there are very few things that an inspector finds that cannot be fixed by licensed contractors. Uh, and qualified personnel. And uh, so there shouldn't be a reason to be uh, afraid of a house because there's something that needs to be fixed because every house is gonna have something wrong with it that needs to be fixed. So uh, you know we rely on those professionals to get that done. And when you go to fill out your sales disclosure, your Indiana sales disclosure, that is filled out good for the day you fill it out. 
So, you know, we don't want to go, there are some questions on there that says, have you ever had? And there's some, some things listed there. And, and for those things, yes, you need to put down if you've ever had, but you have a room to make an explanation. But if you've had a new roof put on, and the year before the roof leaked, when you get to the question, does your roof leak? No, it doesn't leak. I put a new roof on it. But sometimes people get a little bogged down with that. Okay, Mike, tell us about pest. Pest. Thank you, Carol. Um, I'm Mike Losing Up with McMahon Exterminating. We do home inspections for pest, pest, whether it be termites, wood boring bees, carpenter ants, or wood boring beetles. What we're here to do is make sure that the investment you're getting ready to purchase is safe for termites. You know, is there anything going on right now? In doing so, what we do is we get underneath the house. If it's a crawl space, we get underneath there, look underneath it. We look around the outside, in the garage, get up in the attic, we look out there where we can. Thing with our inspections though is if there's stuff that's in the way. You know, most garages, we have those nice canvases full of stuff. We don't move stuff away from that. But we're gonna try our best to look in there and see if there's any kind of activity on that. What we like to sit there and find out, see if they've got termites, we'll let you know that day. Some places might have had a termite treatment. What we look for on termites, they have what we call termite shelter tubes. Well, I like to say it's about the size of a number two pencil. It's about how wide the things are. They look like sand tubes. If you look there, now, man, there's some sand on here. Could be termites. What we're going to do is, if they're intact, we're going to tear that open and see if there's any kind of termite activity going on in there. You know, it's kind of like today, right now. You know, if I fly over the top of your house, you're not home. But I can tell if I look over the top of your house, somebody's living there. You know, you've got your furniture, your clothing, food, but you're not there right now. Same way with the termites. You know, we might tear that tube open right now, and we might not see any activity, but somewhere there's termites because there's what we call an intact tube. Termites have had humidity control, so if that tube is broken open, they can't control that humidity. If it's intact, most likely there's termites somewhere. We're going to call it out. What we look for is see if they've had a termite treatment. Usually it's by grill marks in the concrete, in the garage floor, and on your front porch. If we come in there and we see that there's been treated for termites, and we find that there's intact tubes, we we'll recommend that you sit there and find out if they have a valid contract out there for you. And if they do, they need to have that treat retreated. If they don't, we're going to recommend you get that house treated. You know, Usually that is at the seller's expense. You know, I've never seen, correct me wrong, never seen a buyer pay for it. Only time I've seen a buyer pay for a termite treatment is if you're paying $200,000 for the house and a termite treatment is $1,000, I've seen it to where you pay the $199 for the house and you'll say, I'll pay the thousand. You just deduct it from your purchase price. I've seen it that way as well. With boring bees, a lot of people with think wood boring bees aren't that bad. They put little about the size of a dime hole in wood around the house. They think, it's not that bad of a deal. They're not that bad in that case. But what becomes a problem is woodpeckers. Woodpeckers will come and start eating that larva out and tear that wood up terribly. That's where they really become the destruction part of it. But we'll sit there and call that out. What we recommend on wood boring bee hose, if you have them on your house, you can already sell it. Don't cover the hose up right now. This is not the time of year to be sealing them up. Because if there's any bees in there that develop, they're going to drill a hole through the wood and make another hole out there. We recommend doing it late October, early November, after you have a good freeze. So if you're selling your house, fill it in with caulking like about then, or if you're buying a house, have it done in the wintertime when you have a good freeze on there. Um, kind of got over it. What we're looking for again is see if there's any kind of visible evidence with termites or with carpenter ants or with boring bees, anything like that. If there is something out there, we're going to put it on a report that yes, there is some activity, whether it be partial, scarring, whatever the case might be. Some people have a misconception that my house is new, I shouldn't have termites. Went to a house last week, seven year old house, brand new. They have termites in the basement, in the middle of the house. So they had to give a treat. You know, they were kind of upset, because I would be too. You think a seven-year-old house 
shouldn't have to worry about right now. Termites don't care how old your wood is. Termites will eat wood. What they're looking for is cellulose. So it might be wood, they'll eat the paper off the drywall. They'll also eat, they've got that blue insulation of bone board, you'll, you can buy it at Lowe's or Home Depot. They will eat up into that as well, and give me cellulose. So we're always looking forward to that. Um, again, like we said, said, if we see a treatment, we recommend that you sit there and see if it's warranty is transferable. Some houses will have what we call monitoring stations in the ground. It's a little round monitoring station you won't see. They put about four corners of the house. And all that is is a little one by two wood in the ground to see if there are termites that come there. We like to look through the whole house to make sure there's no termites besides that little one by two. You know, the house you're buying, they might say, hey, we have an under-pest control. We don't have any termites. They, they're a termite, they're not a termite. Their bug person might not be an official inspector. You know, they just might be like, yeah, I don't see anything. You want to get somebody who knows what they're looking for to take care of it. At McMahon, there's three of us. I'm the lead, the lead inspector, there's two others. That's, we do that all day long. We're doing two to three homes a day a piece. And sit there, so we got a pretty good reputation on it, and making sure we take care of your investment. But other than that, if you don't know, have any questions, just ask me. Sound good? And termites like damp? They like, they like damp. Prime example, we have a one in here, Newburgh. Crawl space had a lot of water in it. Sun pump issue. Kind of like what Ron was talking about. Getting ready to enter. We will not do an inspection if there's water standing in the crawl space for our safety. You know, if there's loose hanging wires in there that's live, you know what? I want to go home to my family at night. Mm -hmm. So we'll, you know, what we do is we just request that it is drained out. And once it's empty, we will come back and re-inspect that. No additional cost. And that's just that part. If you're buying a house, we're going to provide you a service to the best of our ability. Or that means that if it takes two trips, it takes two trips. Went back out there, and I did find termites. And I spoke with a customer today. He had one day calling. I spoke to him twice now in the evening. You know, I tell the customers, give me a call. Do not hesitate to call me if you think of something. And as of right now, the buy is going to go through. He was afraid. That house in mind is termite infested. Why does I want to sell it? Termites aren't that bad. There's no wood damage from it. We caught it early in one of the things. We help you walk through it, talk to the real estate agents as well. If they have any questions, they contact us. Termite treatments, if you do it today, termite treatments last for 10 years. If they're using what we call a terminal. Terminal is the best product out there. Some other pest control companies will use the lesser product. But we have seen where you've had to go out and do a retreat for termites if they use a lesser product. But terminal is the best one out there. Any questions? Any questions? Okay, the only thing that I, I might add on the termite is a lot of people will say, well, I have, you know, I don't have termites, I'm under contract with another company, and then you'll go down there and they'll find those little shelter tubes. So that's how. Those guys know that that house really hadn't been treated properly or they haven't been in there. So um, sometimes we run into a little bit of an issue as represent a buyer that the seller will say, well, gosh, you know, the seller's agent will say, you know, oh, here's from Joe's, you know, termite company. Um, but if those shelter tubes are there, then that's a sign that they, 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 they may have treated it and didn't go in and get rid of those, but that's the only way they know. So. Yeah. Yeah, when we do a termite trip, it's like Charles said, when we do a termite trip, we knock those tubes down. That way we come back out there, if we see more tubes, you've got live activity. That way you're like, well, was that old, new? Don't go we like to turn them down. <laughs> <laughs> That's you. fraud. How, how long does it take for yes, a termite to rebuild the tube once it's been cracked or destroyed? Within a day. They, they'll start, because what they'll do is they've got, they're like an army. They got their soldiers and all of that. Once we tear it open, they'll have their sergeant kind of come up there and say, "Okay, what happened? It was it weak, weak construction, or do we have a predator out here?" If it's weak construction, he tells the rest of the soldiers, "Come up here and start rebuilding this." And doing that kind of um, real quick. Had one last year. They had tubes. 
house has been treated, I tore the tube open, I didn't see anything that day. Kind of like I said, if I fell over the top of your house, most likely you're living there, you're just not there now. Called it out, even though it had been treated, we retreated it. Our termite guy went out there, and again, when they do that, he's got to treat that area as well. So he got down there, tore the tubes back open, and they were just going crazy right in that area. So prime example, if there are tubes, there's termites somewhere. And we do a treatment to the whole house. We just don't do yeah, this if, one wall. If, if there's termites on your house, we're taking care of all of it. And if there's a detached garage, usually you recommend treat everything. Yeah, yeah. if you got termites in your property, it's safe now. Again, it's an investment. Protect your investment. You're going out tonight, Rich will talk later, maybe tonight, insurance. You're buying insurance to protect your home from fire, lightning, and all that. That's why a termite treatment is. Is to protect your house. You don't even need it. And then they get a, that day is. and then you get a warranty, and they come out every year and check. Yep. So, and there's a fee for that. Yes. What about 125, 150 dollars? 125, 150. Try to fix upon the size of the house. Yeah. You know, kind of, you know, kind of average, kind of idea of about how much of an inspection costs for WDI, which is a wood destroying insect inspection report. Basic size, about 125 bucks is what it's going to cost you to get an inspection done, depending upon the size of the house. Great, thanks. Yes. Mike. That's the cool okay, uh, let's talk about real estate agents and finding a real estate agent. Um, I'm going to talk first about um, looking for real estate agents if you are a seller. So you're a seller, you decide to sell your house, what should I look for? You should look for uh, a real estate agent that has a very comprehensive uh, knowledge of the market and that has a marketing plan that is going to help you sell your house. Uh, you also need somebody, we've already talked about getting houses ready and what you need to do, but that is gonna be honest with you about what needs to get done. Because I, I go to a lot of, I, I do a lot of competitive, and I, I know the other agents on the team go to a lot of competitive situations where we're competing against another real estate agent, and they'll come in and they'll tell somebody, Oh no, you don't need to do anything. It's lovely. It's great. And that's what people want to hear. I want to hear that my house is lovely and I don't need to do anything to it because I don't want to spend any money and I don't want to spend any time. But, um, you know, maybe it, it's really not. So it, it's not easy for us to go in and say, you know, Rich, you got to paint that room or take down this wallpaper or clean your gutters or whatever it is you, you need to do. So I think you need somebody that you can develop a rapport with that will be honest with you about what you need to do. And then marketing wise, you know, most of us do the same stuff. You know, we're gonna put up a sign and we're gonna have open houses if you want them and we're going to put your house in MLS and we're gonna do all those kinds of things. But what are the things that one agent or group can do that distinguishes it from other groups? So what kind of marketing, social media, you know, how many Facebook, Posts do they do? What does it look like? What do videos look like? Do they do drone uh, videos? All of those things. And you can get on websites. We have a website, team-mcclintock.com. Uh, I never remember where to put that. Get on the agent's websites. Look at what they're doing, and that will give you a really good idea of um, what kind of effort that they're going to put in your house. We tell people when they list their home, that their home is for sale 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Because everybody's online looking at houses all the time. So last month, uh, the Tucker website had over 100,000 hits, of people looking at homes. So there's people out there all the time. So it's really important to look at how that looks because we look at pictures of homes and think, ooh, you know, that doesn't look very good or there was a house listed last week where the house was actually crooked. You know, so you're kind of trying to look at it like this. So really look at agents' websites. That is really, really helpful. And, and how they're perceived in the community. Um, you should ask for a comparative market analysis where agents actually come in and they try to figure out what the house is worth in today's market. Now this is um, aided by now anyone can get online and look and see what homes sold for in the market because they can get on the assessor website. So it's pretty easy to do. Sometimes when I go meet with clients, they've already done their homework, they already know all that.
but um, we may have some information that they don't have, specifically about the square footage and the number of bedrooms and bathrooms, because the assessor site is not always accurate. And sometimes the data sheets are not always accurate, but usually real estate agents are pretty good about that. Um, we've had some cases where even, you know, we've not had the right square footage by 100 square feet or something because the information was not correct. And that's why we always ask if clients have had an appraisal because real estate agents are not licensed appraisers and we are not trained to professionally measure a home. So the best thing to do is to have an appraisal, even if it's old, because then the home's been measured. Um, so you want to compare to market analysis and so that you know where to price the home properly. And we're going to talk a little bit more about band pricing and that later tonight. Um, and then buyers, you know, it's pretty simple. You need an agent that is familiar with the market that will go that extra mile. In addition to sending you houses, looking at the houses you send them, which is a lot of the way it comes to us now, buyers will send us 20 houses. You know, these are the ones I want to see. They don't, we don't even have to really look them up. Well, we want to check those, make sure there's nothing really wrong with them before we waste our buyer's time looking at them. We also want to see if there are other homes that maybe they missed because, um, you know, whatever reason when they were looking through, they didn't pull a house and maybe we've been in it. It's really nice. We think that's one that should be added to the list. So somebody that's familiar with the market that sells a lot of real estate, which is also helpful when you're helping sellers. Because if you're working with an agent that doesn't really sell much, they don't know how to compare what's in the market. So you want someone that's experienced and then that can guide them, as you hear tonight, all these different things that you have to do. You have to get the inspection set up, you've got to get the banking set up, you've got to do all that. And you need an agent that can do all those things for you and uh, keep things moving along. So, uh, so we recommend you use Team McClintock. <laughs> But whomever you use, make sure that they're qualified and um, that they can help you through that process. Okay, so our next area is mortgage. Why you should get a pre-approval before you go shop for that home if you're a buyer. And we have Jennifer Roll with Old National Bank and she's going to share um, some reasons that you need to get pre-approved before you shop. Hi, I'm Jennifer Roll. I'm with Old National Bank. I've been with Old National Bank a long time. It'll be 30 years this fall. I can't wait that. Um, and I've been in the mortgage department the whole time. So while I've seen lots of changes in it, there's some of this that hasn't changed at all. And one of the things that hasn't changed is it's really important to talk to a banker before you go out and start looking at houses. You want to know whether you're a first-time buyer or you own a home and you're wanting to, to buy a larger home. You want to know the appropriate price range that you should look in. You also want to make sure that your credit's good and, and what products might be appropriate for you. The thing that occurs to me right now is that we are in the seller's market, so in just about every price range in our area, you can find a house that you want to make an offer on and present your offer and there's or four other offers coming in at the same time, and that might happen when the house has just been on the market a day or two. So if you're the most prepared person making an offer, if you've got your pre-approval in place and you're working with a great realtor and so the listing realtor knows, has confidence in this offer that they're getting, you're gonna be the most likely person to get your offer accepted, assuming you're making a good offer. Um, I think that's, that's the biggest reason is just to make sure that when you go to present that offer, you've got all your ducks in a row and you know that you're, you're not making an offer on a home you can't afford, you know, the product you, that is appropriate for you, um, but mostly that right now, be, just because of the competitiveness of the seller's market situation. So I did bring um, a little bit of literature. There's folders in the back. There's things in there that tell about our various products that we have, just general information. There's information for first time buyers in there and there's other things as far as definition of terms and information that we look for when we're doing an application. The pre-approval process is really easy. We can do that over the phone in about 10 minutes. So um, just my, my card is in there. If you want to talk to me, just give me a call. 
but regardless, give, you know, be sure that you're talking to a good lender and you get that pre-approval in place before you start looking at houses. Here. There you go. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. A um, couple things that I just should have covered two under um, what to look for. If you're a buyer, you want to get a home buyer's warranty. So if you're a seller, you want to offer a home buyer's warranty. Help sell the house. It gives the buyer um, some comfort that after they take over, they're going to have this warranty that's going to cover many of the things in the home. And um, this is our seller questionnaire. And if you are a potential seller, I brought some copies of this. Be happy for you to take one home. This really helps you organize what you're going to do. It asks you a lot of questions. We've spent years developing this. Basically, every question that anybody could ask about your house is on here. The main reason buyers do not buy a house, and this is why it's difficult to sell for sell by owner, is because they can't get their questions answered. And if you answer them all here, and we know it, then we don't even have to bug you. This is when the realtor calls us and asks us. And then we, I did bring some of our marketing brochures as well, so we've got those all back. Okay, number six. We're going to move along here. All right, and we have with us J.T. McCarty who's going to tell us why the grass is always green. Mm -hmm. Right here for the Colonial Garden Center. Good evening, everyone. Um, pleasure to be here. Um, I speak about landscaping and uh, nursery and plants and flowers from, uh, oh gosh, a company started by my dad 60 years ago, or thereabouts, 1960. Um, my grandfather was a cooperative extension agent in Van Buren County in 19 and 20. He went to Purdue in 1918. My grandfather went to Purdue after World War II and graduated in 1950. I went to Purdue in 1975. So we have three generations of Boilermakers. I love IU, but Purdue is the Today university. is IU day. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you went to IU, you're like IU, yeah, that's fine. Let me just wait. Um, I had the privilege of serving as the national, uh, in a national capacity, as the president of the Garden Centers of America uh, back in the 90s. My father served in a capacity as the president of the National Landscape Association back in the mid 70s. Um, to that extent, when we both served on those boards, part of our responsibility was to help to manage uh, and be stewards of our constituents' money. And one of the things that we did was to invest in the Gallup poll people to go out and call consumers all around the country to ask them how much money they spent on the exterior of their homes to beautify them relative to the cost of their total home. So if you lived in Boston, possibly, or Orange County, California, or a high density area where the homes were close and really nice, a lot of times those people would spend upwards of 12 to 15 percent of the total value of their property on landscaping or walls or patios or maybe irrigation or a water feature or plants. Spend $100,000 on a home, they would spend 12 to $15,000 proportionately on their home. Um, we folk in the Midwest are a little more conservative. We have more lawns. We have bigger lawns to mow. We have bigger lots. Conservatively speaking, we would spend maybe more about three to six percent on the average, maybe five, here in Evansville. And of course, we pay these people to call all around the country. If you lived in Florida, if you lived in Washington, New York, Kansas, whatever. So, if you live here in the Midwest and you have a home that might be a million dollar home, you might be more inclined to spend 50,000 or 5% of that value of the property to beautify your home. That being said, one of the first things that Carol or any competent um, uh, real estate agent would tell you is that, and women probably know this more than men, when you first see something, that visual impact and that first um, impression that you have of something is pretty impressive and it might set the stage for other things. So that curb appeal concept, when you pull up to a piece of property and you're considering your home to being sold or you're going to buy a home, you're looking at that relative to 
what the neighbors are doing? Is this a home that the landscaping and the exterior beautification of the home is in proportion to the home? Is it over improved or under improved compared to the keeping up with the Joneses and the other people in the neighborhood? Um, what we know from experience, and I think Carol and I talked about this just the other day, um, and I was on this board back in the 90s. I still stay very active in the industry, and we are colonial, by the way, on outer on Epworth and the Lloyd. And yes, we used to have a place on Green River Road. That was where my office was, and we had a place in North Park, and we had one in Newburgh here, and um, on outer Lincoln. The retailing changed a lot in the last 20 years. Well, we changed with it. And we went from about 70, 60, 70 percent retailing, 20 to 30 percent service to now 60 to 70 percent service and maybe 20 to 30 percent retailing. Why? Retailing's changing. You know, just read the paper of how many H.H. Greggs and all these other places are going out of business, and I can tell you about Keister's and the Evansville store and Bainham's, and so we're still surviving. But why? Because we're recognizing that people need to have service provided these days. We're all working more, aren't we? And we need to have landscaping, mowing, we need to have pruning done, we need to mulch your yard, we need to do all these things. Well, the most important thing to realize when it comes to the value of landscaping, and again, Carol and I talked about this the other day, if you properly plan for your landscaping and you have a competent landscape contractor or a nurseryman help you, put the right plants in the right place, it can increase the value of your home anywhere from a minimum of 12%, maybe up to 15 or 20, as we were talking about the other day. So I'm here to tell you, this is an important consideration for you, okay? Curb appeal, what do people see the minute they pull up? Uh, are the shrubs pruned? Do you have mulching down? Do you have the right plants in the right spot? So uh, I would tell you that's an important thing. And do you need for me to say anything else? Do you want me to, do you want to ask me about landscaping or anything accordingly? Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, and remember, and Jay, JT was, and I know you guys were going to talk too, but uh, one of the things that we talked about before you got here is just real simple, you know, keeping it simple. So, you know, worst thing you do is you pull up to your house and you can tell the bushes are like a thousand years old. They were the original ones put in with the house. So the top has green and the bottom of you know, it might be time to take those out. Uh, also, if it's way overgrown, you can't get to the front door. That's always a bad sign. It's a bad sign. Yeah, bad yeah. sign. So yeah. you probably invest a little bit of landscaping. Um, something else I tell people all the time, JT, is when they're buying a house, biggest investment they can make is something that is going to help them screen from neighbors behind. You know, some white pine, something like that. It doesn't have to be elaborate. We call it a living fence. A living fence. <laughs> But I think mulch, uh, we talked about cleaning earlier before we got here. Yep. Cleaning that front door. Pull the weeds. Pull the weeds. So, because that's the first thing people see when they're coming into your house. So it really is important that make a first impression. So, yep. good first impression. All right. Thank you, JT. You're welcome. All right. Let me get you out of here. 730, folks. Um, I'm, real quickly, when you're going to buy a house, our number seven is develop a realistic wish list. Okay, so somebody said to me today, I've got a whole list of things that I'm going to let Brittany show them as I talk through this quickly. If you're a buyer, you have to be realistic. So today, someone said, oh, I have a client that wants to spend you know, $400,000 on a house, and they want an acre of land, and they want the house to be new, and they want it within walking distance of a supermarket, and la, 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 la. So, uh, Keith and Robert said it's cheaper to move to the supermarket. You know, there you have to look at the market and see what's going to be realistic. And sometimes we have to adjust our priorities. So we've got to decide what the most important thing to us is. Do we need four bedrooms because we've got four kids? Do we need three bathrooms because we've got four kids? Um, is there a place to play? Is it safe? You know, all those kinds of things. So when you're looking, when you're a buyer, you're not going to get everything unless you're going to spend a million dollars and build the house yourself. And then you're going to know exactly where everything is. So just be realistic as, as, uh, as a buyer because that, otherwise you're going to get very frustrated and you can work with your realtor to help develop that. And sometimes it's okay to go look at some houses first 
and you get you sort of hone and get a better idea of what's realistic as you're moving along. Okay, number eight. Now this is not going to happen if you have it landscaped properly and it's clean and you have it pre-inspected and you have the termite bed. But there, these are the worst words that realtors hate to say. I am in no hurry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well. I'm so glad you called me then. Uh, I, thought, I thought you went to Sutter House. I didn't think you wanted to just put a sign in the yard. Um, people really watch days on the market. Probably the most asked question in the real estate business is, why has this house been on the market so long? Well, there are reasons it has. It's, been, it's three things sell a house. Price, condition, location. So you can control the price, you can control the condition, you cannot control the location. So if you look around, houses that have been on the market, a lot of them are because of location, but some of them are because of price and condition. And sometimes we're wrong, you know, when we price, help you price a home. You know, we want you to get the most that you can for your house. We try to give you realistic information, but sometimes we're wrong. So uh, sometimes you have to uh, adjust that. So you get feedback. You're the seller. You get feedback every time you show a house. Biggest feedback is how many showings am I getting? If you're not getting any showings, that's some strong feedback. If you're getting 2,000 people looking at your house online and you got zero showings, we may have priced it wrong. So we may have to make a quick adjustment. Like to make those within the first couple, three weeks. We don't want to wait too long. Um, if you're getting showings, then you're going to get feedback. Most realtors are pretty good about giving the listing agent feedback. You want to read that feedback because realtors really, as a rule, don't want to say bad things to people about their homes. So if they're saying, hey, it smells like dog, or hey, that front landscaping is awful, or whatever it is, you know, there may be things that, that you want to do. So after 90 days on the market, your realtor should do a new, quick, it doesn't take us that long, folks, to do a market analysis and look at what has sold in the market since you've listed. Have you missed some opportunities? Is there some kind of adjustment that needs to be made? So, don't, don't, please don't say to us, I'm in no hurry to sell. Because that's, yeah, that's not good. All right, now we're going to have Mindy talk a little bit about people want to invest in a home, so they want to know what their uh, return on investment is going to be. And Hi, I'm Mindy Word. I've been selling real estate for five years with Team McClintock. And we're going to talk about which investments um, are best for a return on your home. And so we have a website, www.costvalue.com. And that is going off the Indianapolis market. Um, so, and then I also think we have some pictures to show of minor kitchen remodel, entry door replacement, and basement remodels, which are mid-range remodels. So I think we have a picture of a minor kitchen remodel. And this is actually one of my listings. And um, we kept getting feedback about the kitchen cabinets. They're blue and white. And so the seller went through and painted the kitchen cabinets white. And we've had great feedback from that. And then we also have a front door. So this one, you can replace the front door. They took the storm door off and repainted the front door. but. A lot of people, um, I've seen them take the front doors off, put the front doors up with side lights or a craftsman style front door, something that has more curb appeal to the property. And then we also have on an upscale uh, renovation, new vinyl windows. And you can just see how that just makes the house pop. So it's gonna give you more bang for your buck. So on a window replacement, it's gonna be 75.4% recoup on your really important to look at what you're putting into the property, what you're going to get out. That's great. Any, any questions on any renovations, what kinds of things that we recommend? You know, of course, a lot of it's on a house-by-house -house basis. You may have you know, brand new windows, you don't need to do it. But the difference in that landscape, the first impression, what we've been talking about, and uh, you know, taking that storm door off, paint the door and the pots. I mean, that couldn't have cost $100. And uh, so, you know, it just makes a huge, huge difference. Thanks, Mindy.
Um, okay, we're to number, oh no, I'm flipping through that. <laughs> Chi Chi, did, Brittany did for me, thank you. So I think we're to number 10. Oh, pricing bands. Um, People look, when people go to look at a house, they look in what we call a pricing band. Usually you say, okay, I'm going to buy, I want to spend $110,000 on a house, so I'm going to look between $100,000 and $125,000. Uh, as the price range gets higher, then the band gets bigger. So usually if somebody's looking at a $400,000 house, they'll maybe look up to four fifty, dollars or they'll look from three fifty dollars to four hundred. dollars so when you're looking at pricing a home, that is important because um, let's say you price your home, like I just had to do this today where I had to do a price reduction. The house is priced at 525. It doesn't do the client any good at all to price it, at, to reduce it to 510. That does no good. So if the house is just not getting any showings at all, it's a unique property. Um, so we reduce the price to 499.9. That gets it in a whole new band, a whole new price range. So then people that did not look at that house before because it was at 525, now may look at that house because it's 499 because they're looking from 450 to 500. Uh, we used to tell people, yeah, you can price it at like, if you want to be in that lower band, like 503, that really isn't as effective as it used to be. Uh, people kind of catch that, so they want to feel like, they can, you know, be in a place that uh, people will actually look at their homes. So, uh, and the other thing is, if you're in a price band that's higher than where you should be, if you're in 509, then people that are looking from 500 to 550, or I should be using, uh, then a, a $500,000 house is not going to compare well to a $550,000 house. And in general, this is not always true, but uh, people are looking at price range they usually can afford it. So uh, you want to be in a price range where your home compares well. Whether it's a hundred thousand dollar home, you know you don't want to be looking at. Kelsey and I've been looking at houses lately. Uh, if, if we look at a ninety thousand dollar house, you know, and then we jump up and we look at a hundred and twenty thousand dollar house, there's a lot of difference in those homes. So you want to be priced where your home is going to compare well. So that's really, really important. So um, so we've given you lots of information tonight, like boom, boom, boom. Uh, we've got a few minutes left. Rich Royalty joined us if you have any uh, insurance questions. Um, these guys are around. We're going to draw for some prizes. But does anybody have any questions now for any? JT, any? Yeah. I have a question based on the, the pricing bands here. Yeah. If a person does lower their home price, uh -huh. below that upper band limit, uh -huh. then can they be tougher on what they give up in the negotiations, or is the same expectation, the buyer is still expecting the same give in the negotiations overall? My belief is if you're priced correctly, then you're not going to get somebody coming in and at asking or offering you much less. I mean, they're there's Human nature is, they're still gonna offer less. I mean, we now, in today's market, we occasionally get um, some bidding wars going in $100,000, $200,000 homes, even $250,000. Uh, haven't seen that yet in, in something, anything above two fifty. dollars But if people perceive, if you're in the right band at the right price, and people perceive that your condo or your home is well-priced, then they're not gonna beat you up that much on price. So the answer is yes, you should be able to, um, not demand, but get close to what your list price is. So we say 1 to 3% is what we hope to get. Within 1 to 3% of your, of your list price. price. Mm -hmm. That's what we hope. And so usually people end up paying a little less, is that what you're saying? A little bit less, uh-huh. Because that's just you, you know, I just, you got your house priced at 150, I'm just not gonna pay you 150. I'm gonna pay you for 140, or whatever it is, you know, that's you just. Like you're getting a deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because there, and unfortunately in our society, you know, 
everybody wants to be a winner. So, you know, I want I want to win because I want to be the last one. Don't have to be that. You'll you'll be a lot better off if you don't have to be the person with the last word because sometimes it costs you in the long run. So. And you're watching a little too much HD TV. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. I went to lunch today and looked up, and there's HD TV on. I'm thinking I'm living in a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> I came down here to get out of the office, and I'm watching HD TV. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. All right. We're gonna give some prizes away. Okay, David and Mindy can do that now. We've got all this